Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Roberts, and as always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Hump Day edition of The Yard. You might hear a little background noise today. There's some work being done here at the house as they uh, pour some concrete and uh, kind of muddy up my driveway, but uh, nevertheless, it's a sign of progress. It's been a long process, but we're getting some things finished up around here. If you haven't heard, Mississippi State has announced game times for next weekend's opening series against... Virginia Military Institute. We're going to be at 3 p.m. start on Friday, 2 p.m. on Saturday, and 1 p.m. on Sunday. And a lot of people are thinking, well, I hope we get a night game on Friday. I'm eager to see the Bulldogs. I get it. I understand it. I can tell you this. Coach Simonis loves those afternoon games. He does. He really does. And, uh, you know, during a regional, you know, we want to play first because you never know what the weather is going to do and that sort of stuff. And so it makes sense. But, you know, when it's cold weather baseball – it's always kind of good to be able to play in the afternoon. And uh, I guess, you know, that's the thing, too. I think kind of the bane of society today is the 10-day forecast, right? Because everybody has become these amateur meteorologists. But uh, next Friday, it's going to be a partly sunny day with a low of 35, but a high in the low 50s. So it should be tolerable for us. That is one of the colder days of the week. It's going to be in the high, the mid 60s in the days leading up to that. We are expected to get a little rain in the area on Thursday, but that should not impede uh, the ball game. But uh, going to have cooler temperatures rather than cold temperatures. So to dress warm for that, but just kind of be aware of that. That was announced today, 3 p.m. first pitch. On Friday, as the Bulldogs open up the 2023 season, it seems like forever and a day since we played baseball because, you know, we're not used to baseball season ending prior to Hoover. It's just not who we are. What we're about is I kind of moved the microphone a little bit closer here. Can you hear me now? A little bit better now? Uh, but the reality of it is, is uh, we're ready to go, man. I'm excited. I know you are as well. And, and it's one of those things, too. It's like, especially when you've got a lot going on, you think, man, I got to get this done, that done, this done. And there's baseball. And the thing that I love about baseball, it's much like football season. I like the regimented schedule. You know, that's the thing about being in our industry is you don't get a ton of time off. But when we're in season, your schedule is pretty much set for you. And you got to do all your honeydew stuff and run all your errands and things like that kind of around baseball. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to getting up every day and kind of knowing what we've got to do and not having to look for something to write or to talk about. I know many of you see it more as recreation. You're just like, Steve, I'm just happy to play. You know, good for you. But we're just happy to see some Bulldog baseball. I am too. And I feel good about this team. And I like the fact that we're kind of flying under the radar a little bit. And we should, right? I mean, we had a bad season last year. We did. There's no other way to describe it. But, you know, after we beat Ole Miss in that series up there, we're thinking, okay, we've kind of got it figured out. We'll piecemeal this thing together on the mound. And we weren't able to do that. That ended up being, you know, really the – you know, the defining moment of the season is the fact that we could not piece it together from pitching standpoint. And we weren't great offensively. This wasn't a good year. There's no other way to describe it, but we had a bad season. And we didn't make it to Hoover. So, in turn, we didn't make it in the NCAA tournament. We're not used to that. We're ready to get back on top of the college baseball mountain. It's important to us. We are completely invested in college baseball. Much to the chagrin of some of our fans, they think that perhaps maybe we are uh, – too invested in baseball. I, I don't agree. I think you put your money where your, uh, you know, where your level of success is. Yeah, I want to be a well-rounded athletic department, but uh, I take a lot of pride in the fact that we are uh, such a good baseball program, and we always have been. You go all the way back to 1885, and, and I, I, I don't care who the athletic director is. I don't care who is on the Ron Polk Ring of Honor Committee. I am going to continue to beat the drum for William Jennings. Never met William Jennings. I don't know if I've ever met any of his descendants. But William Jennings is the founder of Mississippi State Baseball. Of course, we were Mississippi A&M back then. But this is the guy that put our first baseball program together. He was an absolute sorcerer on the mound. Lost one game in four years. Pitched every game. We were undefeated until the final game of his college career. And he had a year of eligibility left. Decided to get married. Go into farming. But most of our fans have no idea who Bill Jennings is or was. His name is not on any plaques. It's not anywhere honored at our stadium. And that's unfortunate. 
And so I will continue to beat the drum until William Jennings is somehow honored at Mississippi State baseball. That deserves to happen. You know, and that's the thing, too, about John Cohen leaving. I had John convinced about several things. One of them was that we needed an, a legacy class for the Ring of Honor. And William Jennings deserves to be a part of that, as does Buddy Meyer. Many of our fans have no clue who Buddy Meyer was. Buddy Meyer, one of the most decorated players to ever, ever, ever play for Mississippi State. Ever. Talked about him on the show before. He was so good. He was so good that he signed a pro contract and played college baseball for three seasons. Of course, there was no you know, amateurism committee and there was no um, there was no collective bargaining agreement back there. Things were, you know, kind of like they are with NIL now. It's kind of wild, wild west. But Buddy Meyer was an absolute amazing baseball player and the only Bulldog baseball alum that played more major league seasons than Buddy Meyer is Rafael Palmero. Do you know who Buddy Meyer was? Do you understand his contributions to Mississippi State baseball? Chances are you don't. And that's our fault. You know, I mentioned uh, both of those gentlemen in the book Dogpile. The whole first chapter of Dogpile, in case you haven't read it, I hope you have. And if not, you need to get yourself a copy. You can go to dogpiletobook.com and order a copy today. But the very first chapter of the book is called Boys from the South. Because of the fact that, you know, in those days, there was no national level recruiting. There were no recruiting services. I mean, it was basically guys that kind of grew up with our, our natural recruiting footprint. You didn't really go out and recruit around the country because you just, you know, travel was more impeded in those days. And so the foundation for Mississippi State baseball was built by and large on the contributions of Mississippi young people. And so I wrote about all of those people, as many as I could. Every Bulldog that ever made the big leagues, I wrote about them in the book. Because I wanted those families to be honored and represented, is even though we had finally won an AFL championship, we cannot forget the fact that there were so many people that laid a foundation for what we now enjoy. I think it is the most important chapter I have written. I've written five books. That's the one I'm probably the most proud of. Not just the book itself, but that first chapter. A lot of people think that uh, we started playing baseball in 1985. We actually started in 1885. And we've always been good. We've always been good. Always, 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 always been good. Had a rare bad season every now and again like we did last year. But we are a national blue blood of college baseball. We should always honor that. And we're not new money like some other people. You know, one of the things that I think it's important, I I point this out in Dogpile too, you know, we were the first, first, SEC school to have lights at stadium. Now, LSU had lights because they went, they used a minor league ballpark. But we were the first ones on campus, thanks to Dutch McCool, the founder of Holiday Inn, also a Bulldog alum. Many of you know McCool Hall. It's not even named after Dutch, named after his parents. We were also the first SEC program to have a full-time baseball coach. Did you know that? Ron Polk was the very first full-time baseball coach in Southeastern Conference history. So we have been ahead of the curve. And while we may have overspent a little bit on Duty Noble Field this time, right, the reality of it is is we have always kind of been the forerunners in Southern baseball. This is not a new phenomenon. And we should always make a commitment to baseball. It's been the one thing, the one sport that's been consistent for us throughout the years. Not to say that we don't love football, not to say that we don't love basketball, but we have been more successful in baseball in our university's history. And I don't think you have to pick one over the other. I don't think you have to say, well, you know, I'd prefer this one. And we all have our favorites, right? But yeah, do we need to fund some other things probably a little better? Yeah, we do. And that's Zach Selman's charge. But the reality of it is we got to take care of football. We got to take care of baseball. And now we're taking care of basketball. And that's one of the things that I, I am a absolute a person that's in agreement. There are a lot of people that say, you know, in many respects, we've kind of neglected basketball. It's true. We have. I watched that SEC hoops thing on the network recently. You know, we talked about all the Babe McCarthy teams and the, the 10 gym and all that kind of stuff. You know, the Bulldogs were great. You know, then we had a pretty rough stretch for a while there. You know, win the SEC title in 91. 
get to the Final Four in 96, had some good years under Richard Williams. And, and Richard Williams and Neil Price do such an amazing job uh, doing color uh, for the Bulldog Network, for Learfield, for Bulldog basketball. But, um, you know, we're renovating the hump. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about basketball today. But uh, I know next weekend many of you are looking forward and kind of making plans to be here. So let's go ahead and kind of get that out of the way. Be here early and be here at 3. It ain't going to hurt you to take off work early. It ain't going to hurt anybody. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I had lunch at Bulldog Burger Company yesterday. Had the BLT salad grilled. No red onions, ranch dressing. I'm from South Mississippi. Ranch dressing is a staple of our existence. Great time. Had the spring rolls too. If, you, if you've seen me today, and chances are you haven't, uh, but if you've seen me today and I look a little bit uh, more attractive, it's because I had the spring rolls yesterday. Yeah, that's right. It's true. I had lunch with a new friend, uh, a, a boneyard listener. You know, kind of talked at length about life, Mississippi State. Spent a lot of time talking about baseball. And next thing you know, we get up and we're ready to go, and all of a sudden we're turning heads because we've had the spring rolls. Uh, but, yeah, a great, great, great meal and it always is. That's the thing I love about Bulldog Burger Company. It's like I know when I go in there and sit down what I'm going to get. I know the quality of experience I'm going to have. I can't always say that about other places. I'm going to get a great portion at a great price and get great service to boot. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. And reminder, happy hour, 3 to 6. Always some happy hour specials. And the thing about that, too, is you can go by maybe get an appetizer kind of top off your work day, right? So go check them out today. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's talk men's basketball. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'll be absolutely honest with you here. We've got uh, you know, a big game coming up. And the thing about it is, the reason it's a big game is we've made it a big game, right? Now, OSU hadn't been great. We hadn't been great either, but we're better as of late. I think that's one of the things that you're always looking for is, is a coach especially if you can stay healthy, is just to start to see some cohesion here. Start to see things start coming together. I believe that's what we're witnessing. Bulldogs now in the middle of a three-game winning streak. We took care of TCU. We go on the road to beat South Carolina, and then we handle Missouri in what I believe is the best basketball performance we've had this year. And when you consider the quality of the opponent, as hot as they were, it's one of the better performances we've had in recent seasons. Missouri's a good team. They're a good team. And from a scoring standpoint, you all saw the graphics. I mean, you know, what, five starters that have 1,000 points or more? A few of those guys have 1,500. We hold them to 52 points. So now all of a sudden, it's pump it up night, students. Get to the mice ahead of the ball game to enjoy some, uh, some recreation with your peers. But we're going to take on LSU. An LSU team that is, uh, has struggled, that was expected. And uh, one of the things that I'll say, too, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Yeah, I think you all feel like me. You know, why isn't LSU on probation yet? Basketball. I mean, it's a, this has been, you know, you talked about how long the Ole Miss case was. This LSU thing, I mean, you had the coach dead to right on a, on a federal wiretap, and he eventually gets canned. And everybody leaves, but the university itself is still there. You self-imposed a bowl ban two years ago. So what's the holdup? What is there to wait on? It's just stupid, man. The whole NCAA enforcement process just it makes you scratch your head, especially when you look at this LSU thing. Because let's be honest about it. Was there a more damning allegation than the Will Wade audio tapes? It seems like that would be the easiest case, but instead, then all of a sudden, oh, we're going after football, and then there's all this education stuff and the sexual assault stuff, and, and I, I'm going to be really blunt here about that. How in the world do you have all these? And this is not an LSU thing. This is really a Baton Rouge thing. Even though LSU had some, you know, there were some things in the football program that Ed Orgeron was kind of fingered, um, you know, for kind of being complicit in the cover-up. But all that said, I mean, you know, as the father of two girls, one of which has graduated college, one will graduate this spring and then uh, take a gap year and then head off to law school. As a parent, you want to feel like your kids are safe. I think I speak for every parent. It's like one of the things you worry about 
when you send your girls off to college, it doesn't matter if it's 10 miles away or 10,000, it's their safety. You know what it's like when you were in school? You don't want your girls to have to face that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, and nowadays people are so much more aggressive and upfront about stuff. But I can tell you, when, when Audrey left to go to college, I was an absolute basket case, man, because, you know, I used to be a college guy. I know how college guys think. All that said, even in the depths of my despair, I always respected women. Never mistreated anybody, but not everybody feels that way. And so when you have all of these sexual assault allegations, and I understand some of them may be a little bit flimsy. There's some of them may be cases of buyer's remorse, but the reality of it is there's no way there's that many of those. It's very concerning. It is. And as somebody that lived in Baton Rouge for as long as I did, I, you know, it's one of those things you look at. I've never been an LSU guy by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, you want to believe when you send your children off to college, they're going to be safe and protected. I mean, I know it's a little bit, you know, Pollyannish in some respects. You don't think life will happen to your kids. Yeah, you know, I've been through so much in my life, and it's like, you know what, I never want my kids to experience this. You try to lead and guide them and mold them as best you can, but there are still people out there that will that'll bring – evil into their lives even as an adult we deal with some of that but you certainly don't want your college kids to have to deal with it right I mean it's, I know it's part of growing up at times the understanding that not everybody was raised like you not everybody has the same value system as them and that's one thing that you know my kids have all told me especially my girls is that they really found out in college that not everybody was raised like them that's not to say one's you know you know, better or worse but you learn that not everybody has the same things you did growing up. And that just doesn't mean monetarily. It means, you know, support. You know, it means, you know, morality. It means, you know, having a value system where, you you know, you value other people. You try to give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, there's a lot of people you learn when you go to college who were just raised differently than you, and they end up being your friends. But there are a lot of people out there that are hurting and I'm not a person that believes in the creation of pain. I think we've been transferring pain since uh, Cain killed Abel in, uh, you know, uh, in Genesis. You know, that's when pain was really created. The next thing, we've just been passing it around ever since. And there are a lot of people out there that, you know, because they're hurting, they want to hurt other people. And so, listen, Baton Rouge, LSU, get this thing together, man. Get, get it together. Get it. Hey, Bulldog friends, our friends from Indeed are back, and they are absolutely better than ever. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire candidates all in one place. Your time is valuable. Don't waste multiple hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find the top talent with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like the Indeed Instant Match option, their assessments, and virtual interviews. You hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of Indeed employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description exactly the moment they sponsor a job. How cool is that? The best thing about Indeed, too, is, listen, these are names you know. These are people that you can trust. They know that you're trying to grow your own business. you got to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Indeed knows hiring needs to be cost-effective when you're running your own business, and many of you are. Put Indeed to work for you today. Visit Indeed.com slash Boneyard to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash Boneyard. Terms and conditions may apply. Curse per application. Pricing not available for everyone. You need to hire. You need Indeed. Simple as that. Get together. All right, so let's get back on sports now. now. Now that's your sermon for the day. Uh, but, yeah, LSU, again, they get off to the good start. And everybody's thinking, you know what, maybe uh, we should have hired McMahon. But uh, they take care of Arkansas State, UNO, Illinois State, Akron. They're 4-0. and Everybody's feeling pretty good. And, and a couple of those wins, while the, the competition wasn't good, I mean, LSU seemed to be pretty athletic. Then they lose to Kansas State down in the Cayman Islands. That's a good place to lose a ball game. They lose by two to Kansas State, but you think, okay, maybe they're okay. They beat Wofford. They beat UT Arlington. And then they go to Atlanta, Georgia, and they beat Wake Forest. And you're thinking, okay, the LSU is going to be okay. Maybe they're better than we expected. They knock off North Carolina Central by 10 in the, in the PMAC. I mean, it probably should have been a much larger margin of victory there. They struggle a little bit with Winthrop, but they win. They squeak by East Tennessee State 72-68. 
as they get ready to head into uh, into SEC play. And again, the margins of victory were not very good here, but um, you're winning games. At the end of the day, that's what matters most, right, is you win the game. But they weren't impressive. And you look at that Wake Forest team and you say, you know what, hey, that's a Power 5 opponent on the road, LSU 11-1 and through the non-conference schedule. So they're thinking, okay, maybe we were wrong. Maybe they've got this figured out. I mean, the only loss is on a neutral floor to a Power 5 opponent by two. You think, okay, maybe the Tigers can be better than we expected. And then what do they do? They knock down Arkansas, who was ranked ninth in the country at the time. And now all of a sudden we're thinking, hey, then they go to Rupp and lose by three. You're thinking maybe LSU. Yeah, LSU. Well, (laughs) they haven't won a game – (laughs) <laughs> since that game against Arkansas. Again, they lose at Rupp in a, in a close one. They go to College Station, lose by 10. Uh, they lose by 11 against Florida in the PMAC. And then Alabama absolutely destroys them in Tuscaloosa, 106-66. to And the wheels have kind of come off there. That's one thing that happens. It's like those uh, high school baseball teams that play all those Class B opponents in the non-district schedule, and they get this false sense of confidence. They get in a district play, and they get 10-run ruled back-to-back-to-back games, and all of a sudden your kids start thinking, wait a minute, we're not as good as you told me. I think that's what's happened to LSU. I think Alabama absolutely broke them. They host Auburn. Auburn beats them by 18. Then they get Tennessee, and listen, we've, we've played Tennessee too. We know the, how, the quality of team Tennessee is. Tennessee gets them by 21 in Baton Rouge. Arkansas gets their revenge in Bud Walton Arena with a 20-point win over LSU. Texas Tech gets them by eight in the SEC Big 12 Challenge. They go to Missouri. We've seen Missouri. We know that's a quality team. Missouri gets them by 10 at home. Alabama travels to Baton Rouge, and LSU makes it a much more competitive game. They only lose by 10. And now they get ready to head to Humphrey Coliseum. That's an 8 p.m. tip tonight. So be sure, if you're, if you're not in the hump, and we, we, we hope that you are, if you're not, uh, please tune in to watch and support the Bulldogs. But uh, LSU now 12-11 overall, 1-9 in the SEC. They have lost 10 games in a row. They are 0-5 in true road games and in 3-1 and on neutral floors. This is a true road game. And the hump is beginning to bump again, to quote our friend Robbie Falk. So I expect a big atmosphere. And uh, the, the lifeblood of our fan experience is our students. And so we encourage you guys to come out there, be rowdy, be respectful, be loud, be early, go to pump it up night, come out there and be ready to roll. But listen, you, you only get a few times in life to really kind of let your hair down, have a good time, and then possibly be on TV at the same time and not get in trouble. Let's look at LSU a little bit closer, kind of look at our numbers here. You know, that's the thing. You, you start thinking, when you lose as much as they do, you know, it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, if things don't go well, you start thinking, all right, here we go again, and then here you go again. All right, K.J. Williams leads LSU with 16.7 points a game. He's got scored a grand total of 384 points. I mean, he's having you know, probably a second-team all-SEC caliber year, just not much around him. We kind of expected that, and we kind of expected them to be a team that really struggled this year because – they had so much attrition, they basically had to turn the roster over. Everybody transferred out. Speaking of transfers, former Bulldog Derek Fountain, he's got 15 starts under his belt, but he's appeared in all 23 games at LSU. Has played the third most minutes of anybody on the roster. And so, hey, good for Derek. And I'll be honest with you, I always kind of questioned if he was an SEC player from a skill set standpoint, but the effort was always there. But he gets processed out here, lands at LSU. He's averaging 8.1 points per game. Adam Miller, number 44 for them. Uh, This is a guy, too, the only other double-digit score for them, averaging averaging 11.7%. He is a volume shooter. LSU has attempted 501 three-point shots this year. He has been 169 of them. And he is uh, converting a a 31% clip. And K.J. Williams, we talked about him a little bit earlier, but – He's got 93 attempts, shooting around 41%, which uh, second on the team only to uh, Mawani Wilkinson, who um, is only 8 of 18. But uh, from a percentage standpoint, uh, a little bit better than Williams. But K.J. is the guy. He is a straw that stirs a drink. Uh, leads the team at 174 rebounds, averaging 7.6 per game. 
So he's the dude. He's got the most steals, 31 steals, got 25 blocks. I mean, he leads them in just about every statistical category. So you got to find a way to make K.J. Williams get rid of the basketball. you got to make somebody else beat you. And the way that we're playing right now, and especially on the defensive end, you got a really good chance of doing that. Now, one thing that's interesting, too, you know, we look at scoring and things like that, and LSU obviously is, you know, 12 and 11. Uh, they're not going to be a team that uh, leads a lot of team categories. But they've been outscored in the first half uh, by 28 points collectively. Like they've scored 749, they've allowed 777. But the second half, LSU has picked it up, but they've also let it down. Like they're scoring more in the second half, but they're allowing more in the second half. And I think a lot of that, too, is just a lack of depth. It's a lack of depth. But this is a game we should win. Uh, this is a game you got to win. I mean, if you know, you, this you 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 beat Missouri, a quality team that's red hot, had won three games in a row, and then you you look you drop this game, you negate that, and then some. LSU again, a team that has really really struggled, and and listen, I think the struggles are still to come. To be honest with you, because there will be sanctions at some point, maybe maybe before we all die, but there will be sanctions. And uh, I, I think LSU is probably going to go down for a couple of years. And I'm sure that's one thing when, uh, when they made the coaching change, they kind of made everybody aware of it. Hey, we're going to be patient with you. We'll guarantee your contract or whatever uh, because we do expect to kind of go through the valley a little bit. But, uh, listen, you got a good coach down there. Just a matter of him getting his players. And they had to load up in a transfer portal this year just to be able to fill the basketball team. And they're not they're – not, a great team by any stretch. They're competitive, but uh, they're not doing the things that's required to win. And so we got to take advantage. We got to win the game. It's as simple as that. We have to go win this game. You win this one, all of a sudden you got a four-game winning streak, and you might even start, uh, you know, seeing your name appear in some of the bracketology stuff, other than you know teams that are considered. Maybe you start working your way into that uh, last four in, you know. I still believe this team is capable of doing it. I've said all along that I feel like we'd end up being an NIT team, and we still may. I think we'll certainly be in the postseason somewhere. But you're 15-8 and eight overall, and you're 3-7. and seven. You won three games in a row. And uh, the TCU game, obviously a big net gainer for us. Missouri, I think, will kind of run some interference for us as well. But when you start winning those games, you certainly can't afford to trip up and lose to a team like LSU. I mean, th- this would be among some of the worst losses we've had in recent years. So, it's not a good LSU team. Got to win this game. And then Saturday, and we'll preview these guys on Friday, we head to Arkansas. And then you host Kentucky. And that's the thing you start looking at here. You start looking at, you know, we talked about this this three-game stretch of Missouri, LSU, and Arkansas being such an important stretch for us that you needed to get at least two of those three. Well, you're in great position to do it. And you could potentially get all three if you can play well at Bud Walton. And listen, that's a house of horrors. I don't care what what type of team Arkansas has, and they are a good team this year. Uh, probably not as good as they were anticipated, anticipated to be in the early portion of the schedule. But you got a chance to get that one. And then I dare say it, you start looking at Kentucky a week from the day, the day after Valentine's Day, you start thinking, this is a vulnerable Kentucky team, and of course you're going to have to beat them and the officials. But Kentucky, not what they have been by any stretch of the imagination. And then you got to go to Ole Miss, who beat Georgia. You know, hey, good for them. You head to Mizzou. But you start thinking, okay, you navigate through this three-game stretch, and let's say you go two for three, and then you've got another three-game stretch where all three of those games are winnable. And if you can get two of those three, all of a sudden you start stacking some things together here. You've got a chance to get closer to 500 in this league. And listen, you know, the regular season ends on March 4th. It's crazy to think about that, but that's the reality of it. But when you start looking at these games here, there's not a sure loss on this schedule. Are there some games that are toss-ups? Yes. Are there some games State should win? Yes. But I don't think you look at any of these games and say, you know what, that's a game we're definitely going to lose. Now, when the schedule first came out, we thought, you know what, Kentucky. Now, Kentucky fans are up there about ready to read uh, John Calipari, the Riot Act. They're sick. It hadn't been a good year by any stretch of the imagination. And I think that's one of those things you start thinking about with, uh, you know, with our schedule is you know, kind of what's left in front of us that looks unattainable. And we've talked all season long 
about how the schedule flips for State in the second half. Well, it has. And then some of the teams that we thought were going to be a little more difficult are not having the years that we thought. I'm not saying we're going to sweep by any stretch because I know how life and competition works. But we're in a position now we can certainly move up uh, in the standings. Matter of fact, let's look at the standings real quick here before we kind of move on uh, from men's basketball. And, and I, I'm like all of you. It's like so I, the illustrious hind dog and I spoke um, earlier today, and he was like, man, we play basketball tonight, right? I said, yeah, we, he said, man, I've been waiting for us to play. He goes, I can't remember the time that I've looked so forward to us playing. It's like, okay, we got to win. Let's get to the next one. Well, isn't that a great feeling as a fan? Because there's now the expectation of winning. There's not the hope of winning. It's like now all of a sudden it's fun again because, hey, we know we can go out there and compete with anybody. But we start looking at what's left. And that Georgia law still just absolutely chaps to hide, doesn't it? But Kentucky, 7-4 and four in the conference, 16-8 and eight overall. So not a great year, not a bad year, but by Kentucky standards, this is not a great team. Of all the teams in the top five of the standings, Kentucky has the most losses with eight. They're 16 and eight, and they can come in here, not to mention, can you imagine the atmosphere? Let's say State wins tonight, and let's just say that, you know, what if, what if we're able to go to Arkansas and win that game? And all of a sudden you've got a five-game winning streak with Kentucky coming to town? There might not be a ticket left to be had. But the top, we're pretty much done with the top half of the conference. You know, you start running through the numbers here. I mean, you know, you know, Missouri and Florida and Arkansas are kind of right there, packed up in the middle. Vanderbilt is four and six in the league. We still have those guys to go. We have Ole Miss and Oxford, of course, LSU, and we get to see South Carolina again. And so, yeah, there's absolutely some winnable games. It's kind of playing out like I think a lot of us expected that we just needed to find a way to survive the first half of the SEC schedule. And we did, and we dropped some games we should, and we probably should have beat Auburn, and we certainly should have beat Georgia. But there's still the possibility of some really cool things. And so one game at a time, that's tonight, LSU. I know many of you will be uh, tuned in. That is an SEC network game. So you can watch it on the ESPN app or you can watch it on regular cable, whatever you have, Dish Network, DirecTV, whatever. So LSU tonight, 8 p.m., should be a game we win. It's a game we have to win. And all of a sudden, you win this one, and you're, you're, you're creeping closer and closer to 500. Closer and closer to 500 in this league. We talked about, man, if you could find a way to get to 20 wins, and, of course, in order to do that, we're going to have to win five more SEC games. You get, you get, 20, SEC, you get 20 wins, and you get to be 8-8. Eight and eight. Ugh. Maybe, maybe I miscounted there. We got one, two, three – four, five, six, seven, eight, eight games left on the schedule. Eight games left on the schedule. So that, that would make you eight and ten. Uh, and maybe that's enough. I don't know that it is. You know, maybe you need to get to nine and nine. But based on how we're playing and based on the way the schedule shapes up right now, if we continue to trend well and play well and stay healthy, you certainly have a chance. And what seemed like maybe virtually impossible two weeks ago now becomes a possibility. You go take care of LSU, then all of a sudden, you know, things are things are trending the right way. But, you know, we're got some, you know, we've won some games that we weren't expected to win. We're going to continue to do that. And that Arkansas-Kentucky stretch right there, I mean, it's like I think about, you know, you, you take down, you know, you take down LSU and it sets up that three game with Arkansas, Kentucky, and Ole Miss. And you get two of those three and you certainly expect to go win at Ole Miss, you know. And listen, Kermit's coaching for his job. We all know this. The, the Ole Miss fan base is kind of checked out. So maybe we have a chance to go over there and just kind of take over that arena. That'd be huge. Win two of those three, and all of a sudden you start thinking, you know what? We're, we're on track. And I'm excited about men's basketball. I know you guys are as well. All right, time for today's top ten list. It's always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. And Blair did text me just to check on me. Because since I was called out, how are you doing? <laughs> You got you to love your friends, right? You do. Hey, go to CloseToBlair.com uh, for all of your mortgage needs. Whether you're looking to refinance or um, you know, buy a home for the first time, there are a lot of people out there just intimidated by the process. Steve, I don't even know where to start. How do I gather all these documents together? You need to work with an experienced loan originator, a guy like Blair Chandler with 21 years of experience in the industry. 
He can hold your hand the whole way through the process. So guy that's a big Bulldog fan. He's got a place here in Starkville. He's a season ticket holder in multiple sports. But you don't have to be a Bulldog fan to do business with Blair. He'll take all comers and do a professional job for you. He'll be your advocate with underwriting. Give Blair a text or call today at 601-500-2344. Again, that's 601-500-2344. Mention to him you heard about him on the Boneyard. He's going to pay for your appraisal, which is about a $500 value. How cool is that? A lot of people want your business. Blair's willing to earn it. Works with Fairway Mortgage. Recently voted number one in customer satisfaction when it came to mortgage loan origination. Incredible. 21 years of experience in the industry. Top 1% close ratio back-to-back years. Get a winner working for you. It's time that you put another win on your ledger. Let Blair help you do that. Again, that's closewithblair.com. Okay, so I had a couple people hit me up after the baseline thing. I knew they would. The majority of the feedback, overwhelmingly positive. I even heard from some guys that play bass and say, hey, Steve, you know, you worked in, you got Steve Harris, you got him Flea, you got, you got in all the greats. And I think we did. And I didn't, I told you guys, uh, Nikki Six, my favorite rock star of all time, I think he's a great bass player, but I don't think he's as technically good as the other people. And please don't tell him. I've never met him. I've interacted with him some on social media. I've met Vince. I guess that's the only one I've talked to is Vince. Snuck backstage at a show, talked to Vince, and then I met him again at Rock, Oklahoma. And, um, but anyway, somebody's like, dude, as big as a Molly Crew fan as you are, how could you leave Nikki off the list? Well, I threw him an honorable mention. But to make it up, I decided today we're going to do a Nikki Six side projects top 10. Nikki Six, of course, the bass player, the leader of Motley Crue, the greatest rock band ever. Nah, not really, but it may be my generation, right? And many of you don't like them, and it's cool too. A lot of people are like, oh, there's just so much hair. Yeah, so, you know, Nikki Six is an elite songwriter. On your know, home sweet home, in many respects, some people consider that the greatest power ballad of all time. I don't, know, I don't know that I do. We haven't done a power ballad list in a while. I mean, Home Sweet Home is great. It got, kind of got overplayed. But Home Sweet Home is amazing. There's so many good songs. And, and that album, you know, Theater of Pain, was a little bit disjointed. You know, Vince had had the, the car accident that sadly took the life of Razzle Dingley, the drummer from Hanoi Rocks. And there was talk that Vince might go to prison. It might not even be a third Motley album or if there was it wouldn't be with Vince they work it out and uh, it felt like the album was a little bit rushed and disjointed but uh, that's the one with Smoking in the Boys Room which is one of the better covers and then Home Sweet Home of course is the uh, the great one but uh, Tonight We Need a Lover Tonight that's another song that I really like Louder Than Hell is another one it's really good but the album in many respects a little bit disjointed but uh, but Nikki has done a lot of work outside of Motley Crue Nikki's produced a lot of stuff and uh, for those of you that saw um, Motley and the Scorps down in Biloxi several years ago. They had a band that opened up called Laid Law. That was a Nikki Six uh, project too. He didn't play, but he kind of founded and produced those guys, and uh, they put on a good show for sure. But here are the Nikki Six side projects. I have coordinated with Roy to make sure that these albums are actually on Spotify. Uh, but first, there is a um, a super group. That he kind of that Nikki put together. They didn't. Uh, they didn't tour. It was just something that he did. It's kind of got more of an industrial sound. It's a band called Fifty Eight. Back in two thousand, uh, had Steve Gibb from Black Label Society playing playing guitar on it. They they released one single. We didn't use the single though. Uh, I decided to go with probably my favorite song on this album. It's a song called Shopping Cart Jesus. And that, no disrespect to our Lord and Savior. But that's going to be our number 10 song today from the band 58, Shopping Cart Jesus. Nikki put this together. And uh, it's different than anything else he's ever done. It's kind of got a Machines of Loving Grace feel to it. It's rock, but it's kind of got an industrial mix. Now, one of the songs that you have probably never heard that Nikki was a huge part of is absolutely incredible. And for those of you that know the Sex Pistols, you know Steve Jones, right? If, and if you've watched the series Pistol, and I, I think you should, it's on Hulu, it's really, really entertaining. Steve Jones, of course, really the founder of the Sex Pistols. Steve had a uh, solo album, he's had several, uh, that he put out that was uh, Fire and Gasoline, I, if I remember correctly. I don't, I don't want to tell you incorrectly. I just want to double check here. Yeah, Fire and Gasoline. And then Nikki wrote a song and then performed bass on it. It's a track called We're No Saints. It is so good. It is, And you say, well, Steve, why is it number nine? Well, there's some other songs I like better. But 
this is one of those just kind of straight ahead rock and roll songs. I'm sure it was a big thrill for Nikki to work with Steve, but uh, probably the one song that I would highlight that many of you have probably never heard. All right, number eight, another super group. Uh, Nikki put this band together with uh, Tracy Guns from LA Guns, who I have also met. <clears throat> met him up in Memphis, and uh, yeah, Tracy's a little different. He is. But, you know, people don't. A lot of people, like you, casual fans. Tracy Guns is the Guns in Guns and Roses. Like before there was Slash, there was Tracy Guns. Maybe you were aware, you know, when you know. Then then there was L.A. Guns and Hollywood Rose and all that stuff. But Tracy Guns is the Guns and Guns and Roses. But Tracy and uh, Nikki put a band together called the Brides of Destruction. It, it had a couple of other names, but they settled on the Brides of Destruction. And of course, uh, debut album called Here Come the Brides. Uh, one of my favorite songs on that album is a, a track called I Don't Care from Brides of Destruction. That's your number eight song. All right, number seven. Now, this, again, kind of a side project. And it's interesting when you look at the fact that John Five has now replaced Mick Mars and Motley Crue as the touring musician. And there is a little, a lot of chatter that there's going to be new material with John Five as the guitarist. I don't know how I feel about that, to be honest with you. You know, Mick is not healthy enough to tour, but certainly Mick is healthy enough to work in the studio. He was with Corey Marks here uh, a couple weeks ago, Corey Marks, of course, the uh, great Canadian country star. If you don't know Corey Marks' material, I'd encourage you to, to listen to that too. But there's talk about there may be more Motley music to come. I, I just don't know. I'd love to hear new Motley music. I just don't know how I feel about somebody besides Mick playing. Because Mick has played every one of them, right? I mean, Mick's one of the guys that's never left, right? Vince got fired. Tommy left. And it's always been Nicky and Mick, and so it's like, I, I just don't know. Maybe, maybe you feel differently. But John Five worked with Nicky Six on this little side project. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And it had Rob Zombie as the singer. Maybe you're unfamiliar. But it's a, it's a band called the L.A. Rats, and again, it was just kind of a one-off deal. And they covered, a bit of a cover, I've Been Everywhere. Johnny Cash's song. And they kind of changed it up a little bit, but uh, it was on the soundtrack of a Liam Neeson movie uh, called The Ice Road. And so it, it's interesting, you know, it's interesting to say the least. But uh, that happened just a couple years ago. You can check that. I, I, I guarantee you, many of you, unless you watch the movie, you've never heard that. So that's your, your number seven song, I've Been Everywhere, a kind of a take on the Johnny Cash classic by the L.A. Rats. Number six, a singer from Norway, Really good vo voice, kind of has a pop appeal, but also a little edge to her. Nikki wrote a couple songs for her debut album. It's a lady by the name of Marion Raven. I guarantee you, you've never heard of her. Marion Raven. Heads are going to roll. Now, the chorus is grungy and gritty. It starts out, and you think, hey, is this Tiffany or Debbie Gibson? And next thing you know, it kind of picks up, and then her voice has a little more grit to it. But an interesting project for sure that Nikki Six is a part of. I suspect you've heard the last five songs on our list. Number five, probably the most memorable song from the Brides of Destruction. Now, Nicky wasn't on the second Brides of Destruction album because he had reunited with Motley Crue, but there were a couple tracks that he wrote and produced. But this comes from the Here Comes the Bride album. But uh, this is a family show, so I won't read you the full title. But it's Shut the F Up. You probably have heard that one before. If you haven't, it's a great straight-ahead rock and roll song, just kind of twos and fours in your face. All right, number four, a legendary song that Nikki Six played bass on on the Hey Stupid album from Alice Cooper. Like, oh, really? Yeah, he played the bass line on Feed My Frankenstein for the legendary Alice Cooper. Now, Nikki, of course, and Alice have a lot of connections through music, but they're also both advocates for sobriety. And uh, I've had many people that have told me about Alice Cooper that have met him in recovery, what he, how legitimate he is. I had somebody contact me back in 2020 that said, hey, they're probably going to have a little get-together and talk some recovery, and Alice is going to be there. Would you come? And it ended up getting canceled due to COVID. So I still haven't met Alice Cooper. And when we saw him in Tupelo, we weren't able to do the meet and greet either. Me and the homie Sam went. An amazing show to see Ace Frehley and, and Alice Cooper. And uh, if Alice Cooper is ever playing within a reasonable driving distance of your residence, you need to go. All right, the final three songs are from 6 a.m. And uh, you may be unfamiliar with 6 a.m., and if you are, I would say, where have you been? 
this was a side project for uh, Nikki, and then when Motley went on hiatus, it became kind of a full-time thing for him. And now 6 a.m. is on hiatus as he is uh, doing the Motley stuff again. And it's probably good for Nikki that he can work with different musicians and kind of gives him a different palette to work with. But James Michael and DJ Ashba are part of this band, and that's where the 6 a.m. comes from. It's 6 and then Ashba Michael. James Michael, of course, uh, kind of a legendary producer in the modern rock scene. And uh, the the 6 a.m.'s cover of Drive, The Cars is Drive, is phenomenal. It's very haunting. It's very different. If you're unfamiliar with it, check it out. It's not on our list today. Um, But there are three consecutive 6 a.m. songs. They're going to round out your top ten list. Number three is Lies of the Beautiful People. An amazing song. And you don't put trust in that, right? Number two, I'm a, listen, there used to be this thing, like, for you young bucks, like, there used to be this thing called the electric guitar. And people could actually play the electric guitar. And I don't just mean, like, two and three chord progressions and get up and play rhythm. Because the world is filled with rhythm players now that use an iPad for effects and that sort of stuff. But back in the 70s and 80s, Guys could actually play guitar. It wasn't all, you know, a product of a, of a computer. Guys could actually play. And they spent a lot of time working on solos, right? So one of the more modern solos, and even though it's not technically impressive, the solo fits. I think I've said this on the show before. DJ, DJ Ashba's solo on This Is Gonna Hurt, which is your number two song, which... This is one of those things I kind of live my life by, right? This is going to hurt. And we're not going to be scared to process the pain. That's what I did for years and years. I, there was always some pain I couldn't process. And so I turned to drugs and alcohol because I couldn't process the pain. And sometimes I, wasn't, I was unwilling to process it. I went to treatment, learned how to process that pain, worked a program of recovery. And so lo- pain is progress. And I, I've heard it said before, your pain is a gift. And it is. It's kind of like, and I wrote about this recently, you know, it's like that big cow, you know, that kind of gets brushes up the barbed wire. You know, there's a consequence. It's a little bit of shot of pain to kind of get you back in the middle of the field and get you away from breaking through the fence and getting out on the highway and getting run over by a semi, right? There are consequences for your actions, and be grateful for them. But this is going to hurt, and I heard uh, Nikki Six talk about this. He goes, I'm the kind of guy, man, it's like, are, are you brave enough? Are you brave enough to, to conduct an autopsy on your pain? and to own your own part in that? That's the hard part. That's the painful part. Is it it understanding that a lot of the negative things that have happened to you in life are a byproduct of your own decisions? You're not victims. You're volunteers. That's not to say that there's not evil in the world and people won't hurt you for no good reason. That's true. There are always people out there. There are innocent people that get hurt all the time. But the reality of it is, is that when we face consequences in our life, it's usually because of something we did. And it, it, you think about any, any relationship you've ever had, whether it be a work relationship, a friendship, or a romantic relationship. You know, these things end, and it's usually because both parties weren't totally committed to each other. Right? And so I think it's important, and this is one of the things that recovery has taught me, is to be honest about my own mistakes. And so when anything that ever happens negative in my life, and I, I know that I'm a bit of an overthinker, my wife will tell you, like anything that ever happens, I'm always looking for an ulterior motive. And then after I talk to her, it's like, okay, I can breathe again, right? It's an exhausting way to live. I'll be honest with you, it is. And I can only begin to imagine how it is for her sometimes. But uh, she's very patient and kind with me. But anytime something goes wrong, I want to get all of it. I, I want to talk it all out. I, I, I do. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not scared of the truth. And who's to say we won't survive the truth, right? You're like, let's just move on. Let's just move on. And I, I don't want. To, I don't want to just move on. I don't. I don't want to. Not yet. Let's not move on yet. Let's address this and let's find out what really happened here. Because I don't want to repeat this. I don't want to ever go through this again. I'd rather burn the house down than live with secrets, right? That's just my attitude. I mean, I, I would rather know because I don't want to go through it again. So, this is going to hurt. Is a song that means an awful lot to me because it kind of mirrors my belief about life. And there's a line in there, too, that um, I know I'm speaking. It's taking a lot of time to talk about this song. But when I, I think I've told you this guys before. When I was in Pine Grove, this is way back in, uh, I guess this has been in 92, right after Christmas. And I went home 
and have my weekend pass to go home from rehab. And uh, it was not fun. It wasn't fun. Um, I was required to go to a meeting, of course, while I was there. And I went to a meeting and, and uh, wasn't happy about that. Found out, too, that my, my mom and my brother had gone through all my apartment, thrown all my, a lot of my stuff away. So I was really upset about that. And I even told my mom, just bring me back to treatment. I don't want to be here. It was tough. It was. And I went to church. And uh, there were some people that were kind of co-conspirators in my demise. But ultimately, it's my responsibility. It's my life. They're my decisions. But there were a couple of people that really high-hatted me at church. And um, it really hurt me. It did. It really hurt me because here I was trying to improve myself. And, you know, I'd, I'd been arrested and I was facing jail time and I went to rehab. And I'm trying to do right. And here I am at church. And then, you know, some people that were hypocrites like I was before, you know, kind of looking down on me. I had one person tell me, I said, oh, you don't know me anymore? It's not anymore. And after what you did. And they don't even know 90% of what I did, right? But there's a line in this song that says there's a devil in the church. That's what that reminds me of. That, that moment in my life when I was there trying to improve myself. And, and I don't listen. I don't need your messages. Listen, you know, my, my eternity and my relationship is secure, okay? Um, so I don't have a negative opinion of church. I'm just saying that there I was in the infancy of my recovery and some people that should have been helping me uh, that were really kind of detriments uh, to my life before that really look down upon me. And so when I hear that line, that's what I think about every single time. Listen up, listen up, there's a devil in a church. And that was me. That was me. And that's how I was treated. And uh, I know a lot of people out there are dealing with something similar, and they may have been kind of disenfranchised by the body of believers. And I'm just going to tell you, don't don't paint the whole body of Christ by experience of one or two people. And I'm, I'm done with that now. Number one, as we belabored that point, number one is life is beautiful. I absolutely love this song. And, of course, there's some dark imagery in the, in the song, too. But, uh, listen, I've been through some serious things in my life, and as we all have, some of us more serious than others. And many of the consequences that I've experienced in life have been, the, you know, the sum of my own bad decisions, right? But there have been some other things that have happened to me just really for no good reason, you know. And uh, that's the thing that you learn about life. And the good book tells us, you know, the rain falls on the heads of the just and the unjust alike. You know, we're all going through the same human experience. But I will tell you this. I am so incredibly happy today. I am. I'll be a lot happier when Dana's home. I admit that. I mean, it's, there are times it gets downright miserable. It really does. It really does. And I, I've talked about that on the show probably too much. But I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my job. I love my life. I love the future. And it's one of those things that, uh, you know, you, you never know what's going to hit you on Facebook. You know, and, and I, listen, I love Facebook. I mean, I get tired of all the political talk, and I love when we don't have elections and people can just, like, be normal. But uh, somebody shared a reel with me, and I don't think they understand that I'm a suicide survivor. I don't think they know that. And um, or maybe they do. I mean, I've been pretty open about that. You know, there was a, there a time I didn't want to talk about it. But, um, but somebody sent that to me. I get emotional thinking about it. And it's like, what wouldn't have happened if you had killed yourself. And it's, I start thinking about that. You know, it's like, what would the world be like? And I don't mean this in a narcissistic way, but it's like, you know, Dana would have met somebody else, you know, obviously. I mean, she's a beautiful, brilliant woman. I mean, she'd have met somebody else. And that, that gets to me. It does. And then there would be no Ani or Audrey or Mia or Ian. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a reminder in many respects, and, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm getting emotional and sharing this with you guys today because maybe somebody needs it, but the reality of it is, is there would be a huge hole in the world if you weren't here, and there have been so many times in my life that I've raced to get out, absolutely raced to get out, but it's like you go through this and you begin to realize there is so much goodness in the world, and there's so many good people in the world. And um, that's one thing, you know, the Bible tells us, as a man seeks, so shall he find. When you look for the negative in life, you're going to find it. But when you look for the beauty in life, you're going to find that too. It's not to say that every day is going to be, you know, you know, rainbows and unicorns and cotton candy. That's just, not, that's just not reality, right? But if you search for the great things in life, you will find them. It's as simple as that. And so I'll tell you, even... Though life at times has tried to beat me down, and I have sometimes uh, 
been a big part of that. Life is beautiful, man. It life is absolutely beautiful. And if I ever need to, if I ever forget that, I can just like pull up a picture of my granddaughter, right? Or I can go uh, listen to a favorite song, or I can get my wife on Facetime. You know, and thankfully I won't have to Facetime her much much longer. But the reality of it is, is like there is so much good in life. And even when I have felt like that I was on the bottom, and uh, yeah, there are, there are times even after when I tried to kill myself when I was 19, there were other times in my life that I considered suicide. And there are probably some people that would be glad if I did, you know, and <laughs> the truth of the matter. But uh, but we talk about a lot on the show, but, I, you know, I, I like to talk about real things because I think that there are sometimes the people that struggle with that. But life is a beautiful thing. And uh, one of the things that I heard, and I'm going to close this segment with this, there was this little old lady, I won't mention her name, and uh, I had gotten up and I had told my story at AA for the first time. I was the speaker, like at a Wednesday night speaker meeting. And I got up and I told my story and I stumbled through it. I did the best that I could. And, um, and I talked about the suicide thing. And uh, this little lady pulled me aside afterwards. And I don't know that I have ever saw her before then. I saw her a few times after that. But she said, you know, God decided you were worth saving. And so who are you to argue that? Who are you to argue against that? I've always remembered that. You know, it's like, there I was being all vulnerable and open, talking about the worst things that had happened in my life to that point. And this lady comes up to me and says, you know what, hey, God decided you're worth saving. God spared you. And so that's a debt that I'll, I'll repay the rest of my life. So we're going to move on and not be so heavy the rest of the show. I didn't expect that to happen. But, you know, sometimes stuff just hits me, and I always feel like the reason that it gets laid on my heart is because somebody else needs to hear it. All right, next segment of the show brought to you, as always, by Campus Book Mart. I'm trying to avoid the, uh, the noise best I can out there as they're working. I have to bear with me. But uh, Campus Book Mart, a stark building and institution, a place that has been here forever and a day, serving a great fan base and doing an amazing job with the best selection of Mississippi State merchandise in and on universe. When you're in town, go by and check them out, kind of neatly positioned on the back side of campus. Very easy to get to. Bully shop, completely renovated. Everything's upstairs. No longer in the textbook business, so they have uh, allocated a lot more space to Mississippi State merchandise. If you're looking for gifts or to outfit your home, your office, whatever, you can do that at Campus Book Mart. If you can't make it to town, we encourage you to visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bucks, absolutely incomplete. Matter of fact, as I FaceTimed with the wife last night, she had on her Mike Leach black and white state crew neck. Get yourself one. You need that. And, again, that's acceptable to wear at any Mississippi State sporting event as we honor the memory of Coach Mike Leach. Campusbookmart.net, promo code BSR. All right. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about the ladies. That's right. How about the Bulldog women taking down Tennessee? And, listen, here's the deal, too. I don't care who you are where you're from. That was a poorly officiated game. It was, and that, I, we're not going to just be sour grapes about stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll call a spade a spade, right? I mean, we won the game, and the officiating was terrible because usually that's what you say when you lose, right? All the commentators are against us and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But the reality of it is we won the game, and the game was officiated poorly. It was. But what a signature win for these ladies after losing three – excuse me, losing two in a row. We'd won three in a row. We lose at Ole Miss, and then it's a terrible loss to Georgia. Absolutely abysmal. I don't care who you are, where you're from. You're not going to beat anybody shooting as bad as we did that night. And so we scored 34 in Athens, and then we get a Tennessee team that was 9-1 and one in the conference, and you put up 91. And, yes, it was a double overtime game, but that's what it took. It took 91 points to beat Tennessee, and we did. After one quarter of play, it was 15-13 volunteers, Lady Vols. We outscore them in the second, 18-16. And so it's a tie game at the break, and all of a sudden, everybody starts tuning in. You're thinking, man, we got a chance here. We got a chance to win this thing. Third period, it's 20-18, and then State outscores them by two in the fourth. We had a chance to win the game, 
at the end of the fourth period in regulation and just couldn't get a shot off. And that, that's, that's just a bad, bad sequence there. We had the rebound. We had 30 seconds, and uh, we call a timeout. We advance the ball, and we don't get a shot off. We don't. We end up dribbling the basketball off our leg, goes out of bounds. They get off a desperation shot, and, uh, you know, it's over there. But, uh, you know, we had a chance, and uh, how poetic would it have been that we scored the winning basket, of course, off of, uh, you know, Rakia Jackson there at the end. We don't, but uh, – we go to overtime, and even, and even in the overtime, it felt like that we were the better team. You know, they come out and um, get a free throw to push ahead, and then next thing you know, we're back up one. We keep trading the lead with them, and it's a nip and tuck game. And with under two minutes to play, we have a one point lead, and you think we're going to do it. They convert one or two free throws to tie it, and with a minute to play, Anastasia Hayes up and in there gives us a two point lead. We get a block. We They foul us, and then we're up four. We're up four with 37 seconds, and you think, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to make it happen. And then it's like the circus came to town. It's like the moment got a little bit too big for us. It's like we started celebrating a little bit more before we should have. We're up four with the basketball. A chance to make a couple free throws here to push it out to six points. And Anastasia Hayes missed them both. We miss them both. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. We get it. We turn the ball over on, on a steal, and Rakia Jackson, to her credit, and while many of our fans don't like her, she's an incredible basketball player. We end up fouling her. An absolutely terrible, terrible turnover there. And uh, she makes both free throws. I mean, Rakia's automatic there. And now it's a two point game. We think, okay, we're still okay. We're okay. We're up two with the ball. They foul us. We miss both free throws again. So, yeah, you make any of these free throws, it's a different conversation today. But that's what good teams do is you make your free throws because that's the only that, they don't want you to score while the clock is running. So they foul you to stop the clock so they can kind of reposition and kind of settle the defense and use the benefit of the substitutions. And we didn't make any of these shots. Absolutely incredible. And then, lo and behold, it's Rakia Jackson – Again, who else would you go to in that situation? She ties it up. So now we have the basketball here. Again, again, a chance to win. Call timeout, advance the ball, and we don't. We turn it over. We don't get it done. And so we get a double overtime. And it felt like even a double overtime, we were the better team. Had a chance to win the end of regulation. Had a chance to ice it in overtime. We nearly choke it away. They hit a big three. Jordan Walker knocks it down to put him up three. And then we go right down and score to cut it to one. We get a stop. We take the lead by one. Get a big block. Romani Parker playing well, former Louisville transfer. Did a great job for us. And then Anastasia Hayes hits a jumper to push the lead out to three points with just over two minutes to play. And it's a three-point play. We convert the free throw. Now it's a four-point lead. We take it out to six. We're making our free throws now. It's a six-point lead, 139 to go. And then, again, it's like the moment got too big for us. We make a bad foul. They make both free throws. The lead is now down to four. We foul again. And, and like, these fouls away from the ball, and, like, some of them were just so instantaneous. It's almost like – it almost felt like the officials were trying to keep Tennessee in the game. It may not have been intentional – but a lot of this stuff you got to let go. Well, they make one of two free throws. Now it's a three-point game. We foul again. And they convert the free throw. One out of two. Now it's a two-point game. So we are up to with the basketball. Rakia has to foul after we get a nice stop there. And then Romani Parker makes both free throws to push it out to four. And at this point, I think we thought, okay, we got it. But we've been in a situation before. The difference was we were up four with the basketball and then ultimately let them tie the game. This time they have it, and um, we foul again. I mean, honestly, we foul again. They make both free throws. It's a two-point game, so now we're up two with the ball with 24 seconds left. The last minute of double overtime, I feel like it took an hour. They foul us. 
we make one of two free throws to make it a three-point game. And then they fire up a shot. Tess Darby from Tennessee, one of the better three-point shooters in the country, had a clean look at the basket. Didn't convert. Romani Parker pulls down the rebound. They have to foul us. We make one of two. We're up four. We're under 10 seconds to go. And at that point, we knew we were good. And uh, just for good measure, Rakia knocks down a very difficult three-point shot with two seconds to go. And all we got to do is get the ball in. And we do. And the game is over. And State with a huge win. Huge, huge, huge win. I did not expect us to win this game. Maybe you did. I didn't. I was just hoping we could be competitive. And Rakia with 28 for Tennessee. Jillian Hollingshead had 18. Tess Darby with 10. So three double-digit scorers for them. But Jerkelia Jordan, one of her better games in a uniform. 24 points for her in 38 minutes of action. Anastasia Hayes with 14. As in a Johnson with 16. And it was really a team effort. I mean, you know, Alana Smith with eight. Uh, Debreshi Poe with five. Romani Parker with eight. And that was really big as Jessica Carter fouled out of the game. Jessica Carter with just seven, and she had foul trouble throughout the game. Only 18 minutes of action for her. But, you know, you beat an NCAA tournament quality team in a marathon game without your best post player. It's big stuff. It really is. But, uh, you know, again, the ladies, you know, really good effort here. Shot 47.8%. And a lot of that is because of the fact that, we, you know, points in the paint. We're able to get to the rim. 40 points in the paint for the Bulldogs. And 40 from the bench. This game was tied 14 times. The lead changed hands 17 times. It was a great college basketball game that was somewhat marred by the officials. And, again, some of these fouls away from the ball, you know, it's like everybody's jockeying for position. you got to let some of that stuff go. And I, I think that really impacted the, the, the length of the game and allowed Tennessee to kind of stay in the game. But, listen, tip your cap to Rakia Jackson uh, that did her best. She is an absolute star. She was here for us as well. I mean, 13 of 13 from the line. Uh, that'll get it done. 11 rebounds for her. Really good effort. But it just kind of felt like State was the better team. You may not have had the star players, but State, I thought, it was just simply better as a team, and ultimately State wins the game. Tennessee's offensive attack really just kind of two-pronged with Jillian Howingshead and Rakia Jackson. But, you know, State doing a better job, you know, off the bench. Uh, not much, but a little bit. At least a little bit better. In a state plus six with bench points. And in, in, in a one-point ball game, it really matters. And so, huge win. Huge, huge win. And then one that I wasn't expecting. Now we get ready to go to Florida. And that'll be tomorrow night. We'll take a quick look at the, the Lady Gators. You know, th- again, this is a game you, know, you look at, and you would probably call it a toss-up at this point. So, we've got to find a way to go down there and, uh, and win that game. You know, it's amazing to think about there's always something to root for. Always something to root for when you're a fan of college athletics. But, uh, you know, Florida 14 of nine, 14 and 9, 3 and 7 in the conference. They've lost one in a row. They are 9 and 3 at home. But uh, this is kind of looking at a recent conference play for them. Uh, I guess we'll go back to conference play. Uh, they lost to Tennessee to open SEC play. They beat A&M, and everybody has. Uh, they lose to Arkansas, and it was not not competitive. They lose to Georgia in Gainesville. They lose to Kentucky. Uh, they lose to Tennessee in, uh, what, 18 points there. And they beat Vanderbilt. They lose to Johnny Harris in Auburn, 66-55. They beat A&M again, and then they lose at Ole Miss. So it's like, yeah, you've got three – Three conference wins, but two of those are against arguably the worst team in the conference. And so this is a game that we should be able to go in there and win. 7 p.m. tip uh, will be on the SEC Network. That's Thursday night. Be sure and uh, tune into that. So you get the bolt, the men against LSU, and then the women tomorrow night against Florida. Two very winnable games. So it should be a good week of basketball if you're a Mississippi State fan. Uh, and, and obviously most of you are if you're listening to this game. And then the next thing you know, you come home and you get A&M, and you start thinking about postseason packing order now. You're 5-5. Five and five. You have a 500 record and arguably the best women's basketball conference in America. Some could make that case. And so you have one, two, three, four, five, just six games left. And so you start thinking, what do we have to do to get a winning record? Well, you, you ought to be able to get A&M, and you hope to be able to get Missouri – and, you know, LSU, that's probably, you know, that's probably a loss right there. But, you know, that's what makes this Florida game so important here. 
you got to get three of these last six, and you feel like A&M and Missouri are certainly winnable games. Alabama, of course, is here. Arkansas is here, but those are going to be competitive games and playing against the top half of the league. And so we've got to get we got to cut hay while the sun is shining, right? And that's what makes Thursday so much more important. You win that one, you get a little margin for error and have a chance to finish 500. And I think when you begin to kind of break this thing down, you know, that's going to put you right there, you know, right there around 20 wins. Around 20 wins with a 500 record. I don't know what we are in that right now, but uh, the reality of it is it's all within our reach. It's everything we need it to be. And so the ladies got to get out and play well. And again, Sam Purcell, a lot of people critical of the technical foul. You know, looking at the, uh, at the clip, Robbie Falk tweeted out a clip. I did not realize kind of the snow angel move at the time. I thought in live action that the Tennessee player was pushed from behind by her own player. And then I see the snow angel thing. And so I, I can see why the call went the way it did. It could have gone either way. But when you're on the floor and you sweep the leg and somebody falls, you're going to get flagged for that. You're going to get a whistle. And Purcell was really upset and ultimately got technical foul. I, I don't know what he said, you know, but you got to give the coach, the coach a little bit of grace in an emotional game late like that. But th- they did, and we got, we got the tee. And uh, if you don't get the T, it's probably a winning regulation. But uh, when you're caught up in the moment and you're fighting for your team, you know, sometimes you just kind of got to say, well, that's kind of part of the deal. The officiating had been terrible. And I, honestly, I think we probably got the benefit of some calls after the technical foul. I think Sam raised his voice, and it wasn't maybe the most opportune time. But I do think that the officiating was a little more balanced in the first overtime. And again, and again, that's when we should we should have put it away. You know, up four with the basketball, and then we allowed them to tie the game. That's on us. That's not on officiating. That's on us. Then in the double overtime, where they're calling all these fouls away from the ball game, you know, that that's one of those things you look at and just say this is just absolute nonsense. But again, a huge win, and it makes you want to get in front of the TV again, right? You know, winning is fun. It feels so good to win. All right, final segment of the show. Brought to you by our friends at Portico. Brooks Bryan is my friend. He's your friend. He's a friend of Mississippi State. He's a friend of Starkville. Part of a great group of developers bringing this wonderful residential development to Starkville. What a great place to live. 1.1 miles away from the Mississippi State campus. Very easy to get to. Turn off 82 on a 12 like going to campus. Very first ride is Pat Station Road. You take that right. Go through the four-way stop. There's Portico right on your right. Next time you're in town, give yourself a self-guided tour. Many of you have always dreamed of living in Starkville. Maybe you just want to have a place here. Maybe you can afford to do that. But the reality of it is, if you have a place here, it makes it so much more convenient to go to the games. You don't have to pay for hotels. Listen, I get it. It's a big undertaking. But maybe make it your primary residence. Maybe it's your future retirement home. Maybe it's a place where you and the family can get together uh, on game day or game night. And rather than your friends and family having to get hotel rooms, they can just stay with you. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home, and really get anything in between. If you need a custom build, they can accommodate you with that too. Phase one's completely sold out. Phase two, nearly sold out. Um, Those houses under construction, many of them nearing completion. Some of those are sold, some are not. But there are also some lots available for you to pick out a lot and pick out a housing plan and make your dream of living in Starkville a reality. Give Brooks a call or text today at 601-416-8075. Again, at 601-416-8075. Make Portico your next move. All right, I spent some time yesterday and uh, wrote a free article. I ran it as a straight Q&A. I, I interviewed Kyle, Kyle Cheesebro. Very interesting guy. Uh, played at Louisville for Coach Lamonis and then became a, a graduate assistant and then went to Indiana with him and then ultimately to Mississippi State. Came here as our volunteer assistant coach. And then NCAA legislation finally approves the funding of the third assistant coach. You know, for years and years and years, it's always been the head coach, a hitting coach, pitching coach, and then a volunteer coach. And some and more times than not, the volunteers work with the catchers. And that's the case for uh, for Kyle but, you know, a lot of this goes back to, um, you know, when Mississippi State was committed to baseball, Ron Polk was here, you know, we had a lot of coaches. We did. We, did. we were very well staffed and well organized. And there were other people that complained, hey, well, Mississippi State's got this big budget for baseball and they're able to do this. So they put in, you know, a lot of limitations, they put in some restrictions on coaching. And so 
now we're kind of riding that. And that's the thing, too, is like the Diamond Sports are understaffed and in many respects underfunded around the country. Of course, we make a big commitment to baseball here. But my point being is that, you know, when you look at the, you know, basically in football, they're just letting anybody that wants to coach be a coach. You can pull people out of the stands. They can call recruits and everything else. But yet baseball just kind of lags behind everything else in college athletics. And so, you know, Kyle is a guy that's had opportunities to go somewhere else, had multiple opportunities to leave and go be recruiting coordinators for other programs. But because of his loyalty to Chris Simonis and his love for Mississippi State, he stayed. And now he's being rewarded for staying. He is now able to draw a full salary. It is not just about Kyle, though. It's about college baseball as a whole. Now, all of a sudden, there are more opportunities for people to make a living on the college level. And I think as a result, the quality of coaching in the college game is only going to get better because guys can develop. Instead of moving to minor league baseball or whatever because they can get a paycheck there, they can now do it on a college level. But I was really interested, too, to talk to him about the catchers. I mean, you know, Luke Hancock was a guy that was you – know, Luke has been committed to Mississippi State uh, it's like since he was born, right? One of the longest commitments in Mississippi State recruiting history in many respects. You know, as soon as he was offered, he jumped on it. Luke has been a Bulldog his whole life. It's been his dream to wear the M over S. And uh, he is the elder statesman now. He's been a Bulldog, been part of Bulldog baseball longer than anybody on the coaching staff or on the roster. So it makes sense to put the C on his chest, right? I mean, he kind of embodies the Mississippi State story. And listen, Luke is not a great pro prospect. He's not. And his age, of course, is going to hurt him this year. He may end up being an undrafted free agent for somebody, but Luke is getting the opportunity to do something that is pretty remarkable. You know, Luke, of course, part of our NAFL championship team, but he was also part of last year's team. And many of those guys had a business decision to make. Don't fault them in the least. And do what's best for their futures. Guys like Cameron James, with his age, coming back would have probably been a detriment to his pro potential, right? You know, they don't want older guys. They don't want to draft older guys. Uh, But, you know, Logan Tanner, those guys move on. We had some other guys that got drafted. It was a little bit of a surprise that, uh, like, Jackson Fristo was a guy that the scouts loved. Uh, Even though it never really came together on the college level, Jackson was a guy that had electric stuff. And when he was good, he was very good. Uh, we thought he'd be back. He's not. Signed a pro contract with the Yankees. But Luke could have signed some undrafted free agent deals, but elected, you know what, I'm going to come back and bet on myself and kind of hope for the best. And it's not even about pro baseball. It's about Mississippi State baseball. And so now Luke makes the transition back behind the plate. That was the position he was recruited for. And then he was in a battle with Logan Tanner, and then he gets injured, and Logan takes over, and then – you know, Luke ultimately becomes a designated hitter. We had some problems offensively at first base. You know, Josh Hatcher's a guy we all love, and it came together for him at Kennesaw State. It was really rooting hard for Josh last year. Josh is an incredible person. He really is. But it just didn't work out. You know, the 2020 year, Josh was really playing well. But for some reason, 2021, it didn't come together. And so you know, to get another bat in the lineup, Luke begins to take some reps at first base. He moves over there. And then the rest is history, right? I mean, Luke Hancock's the guy that caught the last defensive play of the 2021 NAFL Championship season. He catches it, put the ball in his pocket. I think John Cohen's got it somewhere. Maybe they give it to Coach Polk. I think John had it and they gave it to Coach Polk. But, uh, but Luke's back. And now he's behind the plate. And, you know, again, this is what he's natural doing. This is his natural position. Playing first base wasn't natural for him. And there were some growing pains in association with that. So having a guy like him – who's kind of born to play catcher, a guy that's seen a lot of SEC at-bats, a guy that's seen a lot of SEC pitching, a guy that has uh, worked in the midweek and, of course, kind of is your number two catcher, he is elevated. So that makes life a little bit easier for Mississippi State. And he's just a guy, too, that you know, the pitchers know they can trust. There will be a little bit of an adjustment you know, for, for everybody involved. I mean, that's just kind of the reality of life. He's been playing first base now for uh, you know season and a half. And catching a little bit. Now he's catching full time, which is what he wants to do. I mean, he'll do whatever we want him to do. But deep down, he wants to be a catcher. And so we'll give him that opportunity. But uh, we talked at length about some of the newcomers. And, you know, the guy that you're talking to pro scouts and cross checkers last year, you know, before the draft, there were a lot of people that said, Ross Highfield will never go to college. Is he just too good a player? He's too athletic. He is what the modern-day GM is looking for in a catcher. And Ross is at State. 
And uh, Ross's price tag was a little bit loftier, I think, than people wanted to play. And, and listen, the price tag isn't about being greedy. It's like, hey, if I'm going to give up on my dream of playing college baseball and chasing Omaha at Mississippi State, then i got to be well compensated for that. That's how life works, right? There has to be an incentive. And so Ross placed a lot of value on getting an education and playing college baseball, as did his family. It was important to them. And so Ross Highfield, when you talk to anybody that is in the evaluation portion of pro baseball, they will tell you this is a guy that if he continues to develop on his current trajectory, could be a first-round draft pick. Everybody has to have a big-time catcher. Ross Highfield has potential to be a big-time catcher. Now, this year, he'll catch some in the midweek if we have doubleheaders. Perhaps he'll catch maybe game two of a doubleheader, game one. But Ross is going to play a lot. And Luke kind of serves as a stopgap guy while Ross and these other guys develop. You sign three catchers in the class, and that's one of the things we talked about kind of at length uh, you know, yesterday was, you know, the newcomers. And, you know, there's been all this talk about, about Ross, but, you know, Ross is not alone. You know, Ross wasn't the only catcher in the class, and there was some discussion last year, you know, if Luke had not come back, do we go into the portal? And I was told that there were some discussions, you know, kind of some assurances made to the Highfield family. It's like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We're, we're not going to do that. And I think maybe we were optimistic about Luke coming back. But, um, you know, Bryce Hubbard is another guy, too, that uh, is doing well. You know, and, and again, he came from California. Uh, Cheese said that uh, offensively he's probably a little bit ahead of what they expect him to be. Um. But still some room to grow there. But, they, you know, he is an elite catcher, absolutely elite. And Ryan Williams is the guy that got hurt in the fall, so we won't see him this year. But you go out and you sign three catchers, and uh, you get Ross Highfield, a guy that people believe that could potentially play his way into a first-round selection. And you get Hubbard, a guy that was uh, you know, from a baseball crazy state like California, a guy that wanted to play in the SEC, comes to Mississippi State, who is an elite defender, and then you got Williams, who was the uh, six egg catcher of the year in the state of Texas. See, that's what you do when you're a blue blood program. I mean, right? I mean, this is what happens in baseball, right? We're not having to go sign a kid to play, the, you know, at the Mississippi School of Math and Science. All due respect to those kids or anything to play baseball. But my point being is that Mississippi State does not have to settle for when it comes to recruiting on the baseball side of things. And catcher is a premium position. And the fact that State could go stack up three quality guys at a premium position in one class says a lot about our ability to recruit and a lot about our program. So you can go read that in its entirety for free over at jeanspage.com. It's called The Conversation, Kyle Cheesebro. I do those kind of periodically. I like to, I kind of fashion them after the old Rolling Stone interviews, right? I, I used to love reading those rather than, you know, somebody frame it all up with their flowery language. Just kind of give me the questions and the answers, and I, I enjoy that. I, it's easier to digest that. And when you have a longer piece – I think that's a big part of it, too, is you have a longer piece and it makes it easier for people to read. They don't forget their place, right? Uh, but Cheese is a very interesting guy, very interesting guy, and he's been a big part of your program. And you didn't know as much about him because he was a volunteer assistant coach. We said, oh, yeah, well, that's a guy that worked, coaches third and works catchers. And, and, yeah, I get it. And one thing about Kyle, too, that um, – and, and maybe, you know, maybe we disagree here. I coach third base, too at some points in my high school coaching career. My attitude was, especially when um, – because yeah, I know my lineup, right? I know what's coming up in the order. And you can't depend on a wild pitch to score a run, right? You just – you can't. You never know what's going to happen. Like, once you get a guy to third, I mean, there's like, what, what you know, 100 ways he can score. Um, but my attitude was, especially early in ball games, I'm going to make you throw me out. I'm going to make you make a perfect play. I'm going to put pressure on the defense. And Kyle's kind of like that, too. And sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. You know, there's been a couple of times that Kyle's made some decisions I didn't agree with, right? And other times he's made the decisions and it worked out. But I do believe in putting pressure on defense. On the college level, it's a little bit different, right? But, but the reality of it is how many times when there's a runner headed home and your team is on defense, do you expect the throw to get up the line or to go over the catcher's head or be in the dirt? And that happens more times than, than not. Even in the SEC, 
it's kind of a rarity that somebody works the relay perfectly. You know, sometimes it does. Not going to be as many mistakes in the Southeastern Conference. But when you're playing another team, especially a team where you know eventually you're going to get to a pitcher, you want to go out there and put pressure on the defense, but also, too, it puts pressure on the pitcher. Baseball is such a mental game. And so sometimes playing station-to-station baseball, especially when you've got a lineup like we did last year, where you're so inconsistent in the bottom half of the order, you might feel like this is our best chance to score. Our best chance to score here may be them making a mistake, so let's kind of force the action a little bit. So, you know, I, I get it. And uh, as a guy that has probably waved some guys around when he shouldn't, I kind of get it. I understand the thought process behind it. But uh, we're going to get ready to go play a baseball game here very soon. And uh, as we get into next week, we'll take a a deeper look at VMI. We're not going to do that today. And, of course, Friday we'll get back and we'll have a chance to talk about, uh, you know, the outcome of the LSU game and the outcome of the uh, game in Florida. So there's a lot to talk about this time of year. And, guys, in about 30 days we're going to be in spring football. Yeah, right? And then shortly after spring football, we're going to be in the, in the spring transfer portal. And I'm going to say this again, and I'll say it on every show if I have to. You're going to have about a half dozen players or more, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking the over, transfer out of football in May because we don't have room for them. They're not going to play here. It's not personal. Now, what's going to happen is um, you know, there'll be a handful. Of, there's, a, there's a couple people in, in the MSU Facebook groups that absolutely drive me batty. Often in error, never in doubt. You know, I remember, I won't say the kid's name because it's not even really about them. We had a walk-on quarterback recently transfer, and one of these clickbait uh, companies ran some article, Mississippi State quarterback on the move, and I want to say they might even use a picture of Will Rogers. I don't even know. But anyway, all of a sudden, you know, it's Mike Leach's fault. You know, it's John Cohen's fault. It's Dr. Keenum's fault. It's my fault. It's your fault. You know, this, this guy's ready to indict all of us for the Kennedy assassination, right? And it's a walk-on quarterback that's never played a snap. It's a walk-on quarterback that didn't even really get reps in practice. And all of a sudden, we're going to use that as a vehicle to be critical of everybody in, in the decision-making process. The reality of it is, a lot of these walk-ons entered a portal hoping to get a scholarship opportunity somewhere else. And it's like, hey, if I'm going to pay my own way, at least I've got a chance to compete somewhere. And maybe I go to Rio Valley State or something. Or Blue Mountain State. You know, right? And so I'm just telling you, there's going to be some attrition in May when the portal window opens. There's going to be some incoming traffic too, but Mississippi State, because of the fact that we have signed some full classes uh, in the regular signing period, we're going to have more outgoing transfer traffic than we are incoming transfer traffic. You need to be aware of that because we are going to be a team that's going to sign uh, high school and junior college players every year. There's some other people that are utilizing the portal. Uh, to basically supplement their roster year after year, kind of treating all this like a junior college thing, like you're building a team and not a program. We're building a program. I think that is the better way to go because it provides consistency on the roster as best you can in the portal age of college football. But the reality of it is you're going to have people leave. It's not personal. It's not anything you should be upset about. It's not anybody's fault. What do you do if you sign with Mississippi State and you get here, and you get buried on the depth chart, and you understand, you know what, I'm not going to play here. I've only got four years to play, and I can go somewhere else on scholarship and maybe have a chance to play at a lower level. What would you do? Well, you leave. And it's not personal. It's what's best for them. I think it's important for everybody to understand that. You have to do what's best for you. And it's easy to have this old school ideology. It's like, well, you know, when you, you start something, you finish it. Listen, I'm a firm believer in that too. But the clock is ticking on all of us, right? And there's no joy in being a bench warmer on a team you love when you can play somewhere else. And maybe you guys see it differently. I've had some people tell me in the past, you know, I'd go to Alabama, and even if I didn't play, I'd win an AFL championship. You know, that's just not me. I'd rather play and contribute and then go to the Liberty Bowl than not play at all. To go through two a days, I guess you don't have two a days anymore, but to go through all that nonsense and off-season workouts and all the mandatory meetings, study halls, and then to never see the field. And I'm going to you know, celebrate an AFL championship that I really wasn't a key component to, right? It's the way everybody contributes, Steve. I mean, even the scout team guys do. And it's true. It's true. But I don't think anybody aspires to be a scout team guy. I, I would rather be a Liberty Bowl champion on a team that I played and started than be a walk-on and a depth, uh, a roster filler 
for a team that won an AFL championship. You didn't win it. Other people did. You just happened to be on the team and got to get a ring. I mean, that's, that's how I see it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. And so I think a lot of these people that are competitors kind of see it the way I do. I'd rather play. I'd rather play somewhere else and be, med- be on a mediocre team than not play and be on a great team. Because you only get a short time in life to play sports. And I don't know how much time we got left. I, I say that all – my wife hates it when I say that. I always say, well, I don't know how much time we got left. Nobody does. None of us do. But I'm going to find value in every day. I'm not going to just sit here and wish my life away. Right? And I catch myself all the time. I start counting down the days until she's home because I've been absolutely miserable. You may have noticed. But, uh, but I'm trying to find something productive to do every day. You know, something not just for her or for my family, but for myself. Do something positive. I mean, back to back days, I went and got a pulled pork grilled cheese sandwich. Because that's for me. It sounds like a minor thing, but yeah, I'm, I'm under 200 pounds now. I'm trying to get back up, you know. And, uh, but I, I don't fault these young people for leaving. You know, the rah rah thing upset everybody because we saw his value as our player, right? But he has a chance to go play for the two time defending NAFL champion Georgia Bulldogs. And I don't know anybody can begrudge him the opportunity. I don't like it, but I also understand this is the system in which we're in now. I would say that rah rah Thomas made a good decision for himself. Now, maybe that translates into a pro contract. You know, he's got, I've got some legal stuff that's got to get, you know, figured out here as of late. But, uh, you know, the Rai Rai Thomases are the rare exception. You know, most people that go into the portal don't improve their standing. They just don't. They, they may not find a better program. They may find a better opportunity. And that's really, at the end of the day, what we're looking for. Anyway, that's it for today. We'll be back on Friday. And, again, so much to talk about. Again, if you had not done so, go to dogpiledabook.com. And you get all my sports books there, Flim Flam, Alpha Dog, Stark Villains, and Dogpile. Bloom's Oleander available through Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksMillion.com, or through your local bookstore. And Stark Villains gear always available at StarkVillains.com. Come hang out with us at JeansPage.com. We are the Mississippi State affiliate for 247 Sports, the one-stop shop for everything going on in Marine White. If you need to know anything, our panel of experts are more than happy to answer your questions. Engage with us over on True Maroon Board and all of our uh, VIP forums. Uh, Jeanspage.com, uh, bigger and better than ever before. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends and enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.